Brucham Aboyim, again, welcome to our home. Thank you very much for attending. Um, again, we missed last week. Uh, there will be a lecture uh, that will be posted um, on YouTube, again, for a lecture that I gave at the synagogue last week. I was out of town. But um, anyways, so if you get a chance to get to that, please do. Uh, you might find it interesting, again, on the topic of is it appropriate to uh, be happy in today's world. Uh, but tonight's uh, my thought. Uh, uh, I would like to take you on a virtual tour of the tabernacle, God's house. You know, the tabernacle, or the Mishkan, was constructed by the children of Israel in the desert by the command of God Almighty given over to Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, our teacher, the greatest prophet of all time. There are different uh, opinions as to when that command to begin building that the Mishkan was issued. All the scenarios agree on one thing, that the nation began the construction after Moshe came down from the mountain of Sinai for the third time. That was when he brought down the second set of tablets. Now, I hope you will find your tour interesting and informative. But first, let me begin with an introduction as to what the Mishkan represented and also why it was constructed in the desert in the first place. When the children of Israel left Egypt, they were accompanied by the Ananea Kavod, the clouds of glory. Altogether, there were seven clouds, four that surrounded them on all sides of the compass, one that hovered above them and another that lay beneath their feet. The seventh cloud led them by day and gave them, gave them heat and light at night. Then 50 days after the children of Israel left Egypt, they camped at the foot of Mount Sinai. It was there that they received the Torah directly from God Almighty himself. Tragically, 40 days later, the nation sinned grievously and they made a golden calf. God Almighty in his anger removed the clouds of glory from their midst. They were then left defenseless unprotected from the harsh elements in the desert. This situation continued for approximately three months until the nation began the construction of the Mishkan, God's special house. When Moshe came down from the mountain for the third time with the second set of tablets, he told the people that God had forgiven them for the sin of the golden calf. And as a sign that he still desired a loving relationship with them, God had told Moshe that he wanted the nation to build for him a Dira Betachtonu, a dwelling place in this lower world, a place where he, their loving father, could be close to his contentious but beloved children. When the children of Israel heard God's request, well, they immediately began to collect all the materials necessary to construct God's house. Then after only two days, two days, the people had donated all that was needed, and Moshe announced, die, the Hebrew word for enough, that they had contributed more than enough materials, and that now they could begin to construct the Mishkan. Now, the day that the, Nish that the nation began the construction of the Mishkan was the 15th day of the Hebrew month of Tishrei. On that same day, the clouds of glory returned, and they remained with the nation until the death of Aaron, in whose merit the clouds of glory accompanied the nation during their 40-year journey in the desert. This is the same day in the Hebrew calendar that we begin to celebrate the holiday of Sukkot, a time when we commemorate that our ancestors are once again surrounded by the clouds of glory after a brief pause, and that the miracle of the clouds lasted for all the 40 years that they traveled in the desert. Now Moshe contributed nothing materially to the building of the Mishkan. He was credited with everything that was done in its construction. While he was in heaven receiving the Torah, he was shown exactly what God Almighty wanted his house to look like. Every item that was made followed the exact instructions, down to the most minute detail that God Almighty had commanded Moshe to create. As it states in the portion of Truma, that God says to Moshe, according to all that I show you, who built the Mishkan? Well, the master builder of the Mishkan was Betzalel, Moshe's nephew. He was the grandson of Hur, who was the son of Miriam. Now, Hur was the only person, the only person that stood up against those who worshipped the golden calf. His protest, well, it cost him his life. 
Therefore, in his merit, his 13-year-old grandson, Bitsala, was chosen to be the master builder of the tabernacle, the Mishkan. Though he was only 13 years old, miraculously, he was blessed with an innate knowledge and skill to perform all the crafts that were necessary to create an ornate, portable edifice for God Almighty in this world. One that would accompany the nation on their journey as they traveled in the desert. You know, another great miracle was that a nation of slaves, those did, that did back-breaking manual labor, bricklayers, were somehow able to fashion all the intricate furnishings, curtains, pillars, and much more. An ornate portable sanctuary built exactly to God Almighty's design and specifications. The question that arises is, why would the nation need a portable sanctuary? After all, God Almighty had already forgiven them for the sin of the golden calf. In addition, they were just about to enter into the land of Canaan to conquer it. Then shortly after conquering the land, they would have been able to construct a more permanent and elaborate structure that could stand as God's house. God Almighty as a benevolent father always brings the cure before the problem even arises. So even though the command that they would wander in the desert for the remaining 38 years had not yet been decreed, God Almighty knowing the future was well aware of the fact that the nation would sin once again in the future. As we read in the Torah that it was in connection with the incident of the spies, not the golden calf, that God Almighty was once again ready to destroy the whole nation. However, due to Moshe's intervention on behalf of the nation, even though he could not convince God to rescind the whole decree, he was at least able to convince God that total annihilation of the nation would not be in the interest of God, nor in the interest of the children of Israel. Moshe said to God in the portion of Shlach that the nations of the world would say that God was not able to bring this nation into the land that he had sworn to them, and so he slaughtered them in the desert. God accepted Moshe's argument, and he, and he agreed to have the nation wander in the desert for the next 38 years. However, during that period of time, all the men of that generation that had left Egypt, those that were between the ages of 20 to 60 military age, would die in the desert. It would be their children, the children of Israel, those whom they feared would be taken captives. They would be the ones to enter the land. The only exceptions to this decree were both Kalev and Yehoshua and the whole tribe of Levi. That is in addition to the righteous women of the generation. However, there were women who did die in natural causes in the desert, as we've witnessed with Miriam who died. It was the nation's disobedience that forced them into spending the next 38 years journeying in the desert from place to place. This was the, this was the fact that created a necessity for a portable sanctuary, a portable house for God to accompany them while they journeyed in the desert. So let us look at the Mishkan. The Mishkan consisted of one tent divided into two sections, the Holy and the Holy of Holies. The two were separated by an ornate curtain. This Holy housed three items, the golden table upon which the 12 showbreads were placed, the seven branch menorah, and the golden altar. The Holy of Holies contained only one art item, the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark housed the second set of tablets that Moshe brought down from heaven, in addition to the first set of tablets that he had broken. Both sets of tablets were kept together in the ark. You know, we witness the same respect that, pardon me, we witness that the same respect was afforded to the first set of tablets that were broken, as was shown to the second tablets that were whole. You know, from this we learn an important lesson for life, especially today when people are living longer lives, there are times when a great individual becomes senile or develops dementia. We are bound to treat that individual with the same dignity and respect that we showed them when they were mentally sharp and inspirational. Whether one opens a safer Torah or not, it is still holy. The Ark was the first of the holy objects that were constructed for the Mishkan. Altogether, there were three different components connected with the Ark. The Ark itself, which was constructed with three separate boxes, 
the cover of the ark, with the two Kruvim, the two childlike figures that rested on the ark's cover. In addition, there were poles that were attached to each of the corners on either side of the ark. This allowed the ark to be transported from place to place as they traveled throughout the desert. The Hassam Sofer makes a point about the luchos, the tablets, which allude to the Torah, and the Kruvim, the childlike figures that rested on the cover of the ark, which allude to Torah scholars. Our holy books are replete with the debates that our sages participated in with each other in matters concerning the Torah and its laws. The poles were, that were used to transport the ark were never removed even when it rested in the Holy of Holies. This is an allusion to those individuals who financially support institutions that teach Torah. And just like the ark carried those who supposedly were carrying it, so too we should realize that it is the Torah scholar who carries the rich man more than the rich man who supports the Torah scholar. The Torah states that the pole should be overlaid with gold. It did not state pure gold. This is an allusion to the fact that those individuals who support Torah scholars, institutions, and Jewish schools are not expected to have the same pure intentions when they give their donations, as should those Orthodox individuals who are connected with setting an example to their followers in the ways of God and his Torah. God Almighty was very clear on the details as to how the ark should be constructed, in addition to its dimensions and its materials. It was to be made up of pure gold and acacia wood. It was measured two and a half cubits long, one and a half cubits wide, and one and a half cubits high. All of the ark's dimensions were all in halves, which was not the case with any other item in the Mishkan. This fact is important in that it alludes to the fact that for a person to be connected to God Almighty and his Torah, one must demonstrate humility. You know, the Balaturim states that the fact that all the dimensions of the ark were in halves is an allusion to the fact that a Torah scholar should be aware that no matter how much they have achieved, well, it is still only half of their goal, of their perfection in Torah and in their service of God. We also find this theme of humility connected with the Torah. This may well be the reason why each volume of the Talmud begins with the Hebrew letter Bet 2. Most big books begin on page 1. We would have thought that the first page of the Talmud should have begun with the Hebrew letter Aleph 1. The fact that the first page in the Talmud is called Bet, Bet teaches us that no matter how much you have learned, you have still not yet mastered the Aleph, the beginning. But Salah was the individual who personally constructed the ark. It consisted of three boxes, one placed inside the other. The inside and outside boxes were both made of pure solid gold, and the inside box was made of acacia wood. The outside box was higher than the other two boxes, forming a gold rim that surrounded the ark. You know, there were many miracles that were associated with the ark. The ark itself was two and a half cubits long. The Holy of Holies was ten cubits wide. Our sages tell us they, that there needed to be five cubits of open space on either side of the ark. That being the case, the Holy of Holies would have had to have been twelve and a half cubits in length. However, we know there was only ten cubits. This meant that the ark took up no space teaches us that anything that has no ego takes up no space. Another miracle associated with the ark was that only four men were chosen to carry it when they traveled from destination to destination in the desert. There are opinions that state that the ark weighed as much as 36,000 kilograms, much heavier than any four men would have been able to carry. The miracle was that the ark carried itself in addition to carrying those that were designated to carry it. Now, according to science, gold is the third best metal used as a conductor of electricity. Wood, on the other hand, is a dielectric, which makes it a capacitor for electricity. So when gold surrounds wood, it creates an electrical field that would have been more powerful enough to easily electrocute a person, especially due to the size of the arc. As we read in Shmuel Bays, that when Dovin Amelch moved the ark, rather than have it carried by the people, 
he erroneously had it transported on a wagon drawn by two oxen. One of the oxen stumbled, and Uzzah reached out to steady the ark, and when he touched it, he died. So the warning not to touch the ark was both on a physical and on a spiritual level. You know, there are many things that we learn from the description of the ark. The Torah states that it should be made out of pure gold, both be bias or mechutz, inside and out. This command tells us that the inside box and the outside box should be made from the exact same pure gold. Now, the Kleoker states that we find that many times people are really only concerned with that which other people can see. However, when it comes to things that are not viewed by the public, well, then they cut corners and they scrimp on the quality. This is also an allusion to our religiosity. Many people are perceived as gold on the outside. They portray themselves as religious individuals when they are in the public eye. However, on the inside, when they are in the privacy of their own homes or, or on vacation, then their level of Torah observance may, may not be as pure as the image that they display to the public. The makeup of the ark was meant to teach us that our service of God should not be predicated on where we are. It should always be predicated on who we are. The Talmud the Yuma states that Rubble was quoted as saying that any Torah scholar whose inside is not like his outside is not a true Torah scholar. When God gave the command in the Torah that they should make an ark, interestingly, every letter in the Hebrew alphabet was used, every letter except the letter Gimel. The word Gimel is connected with the term reward. This is an allusion to the fact that a person should study Torah, Lishma, which means for the purpose of attaching oneself to God Almighty himself and not for any personal motive. If one does so properly, then they will merit both the Shulchan, the table, and the menorah, the candelabra, which represent both material and spiritual successes in this world. Rebbe Yitzhak of Bardishev stated that the Ark is the resting place of the Torah. So too the Torah rests within a Torah scholar who studies it for the proper reasons. That being the case, the base lady states that it is a mitzvah to support such a person. One should not say that it is sufficient for a Torah scholar to be given just enough food to be able to study. What does he need with honor? Or why should I give him enough money to live in a dignified fashion? He should be treated, basically, with the same honor and respect that one would display to the ark itself. As a verse in the portion of Truma states, that the ark should be made from the same pure gold, me bias or me chutz, inside and out. This can be viewed as a message to those who support Torah scholars, that they should be concerned with the needs of a Torah scholar, not only in their public life, but also supplying them with all that they need for themselves and their families to live in a dignified uh, manner, in private as well. Hmm. That being the case, why wasn't the ark constructed completely out of gold? One would have thought that it would have shown more honor. Why the wood? Gold is cold, inanimate in contrast to wood which is alive and reproduces. This represents mankind to whom the Torah was given. Man is a living being who constantly has to battle against his human nature to attain the spiritual level that the Torah demands of him. By doing so, man can attain his portion in the world to come, where he will then reach the level of pure gold. You know, I think what we will do is stop here, and God willing, we will continue with our tour next week. Let us pray to God, our Father, our benevolent Father in heaven, that he frees the hostages, heals the injured, consoles the mourners, and protects all of our brave IDF soldiers and those civilians in harm's way. With the coming of Mashiach Zakenu, quickly, and let it be now. Again, let me thank you again for attending. And um, again, it means a great deal. And uh, God should bless you and yours. You should be safe, stay healthy, stay safe, stay happy. And um, again, please make sure to subscribe and to push like, if you will, and if you can, share with your friends. Again, God should bless you with all that is good. After this lecture, there will be a musical rendition of a new song. And again, there will be another lecture 
again called, is it appropriate to be for us to be happy in today's world? That will be also will be put on YouTube and Spotify. Again, thank you very much for listening. God bless. Be well. Shabbat shalom.